All right, good morning, Chapel Hill folks. It is uh, Friday morning for me. It's a rainy day. Uh, I've got on my hoodie because I'm trying to stay warm. I don't like winter. I'm ready for winter to go away already. Isn't that sad? It's been here like three days, and I'm already ready for it to go away. That's not why you tuned in to watch this video. You didn't tune in to see James Spam this morning. You tuned in, tuned in to hear from the Lord. And we're going to do that today. We're moving on from our study in the book of Isaiah, and we're moving into the book of Luke today. Uh, obviously, as we're moving closer to Christmas, this seems to make sense, right? We're going to go through this first two or three or four weeks, and we're going to talk about the Christmas story. We're going to talk today about Zechariah and Elizabeth and John the Baptist. And in the next couple of weeks, we're obviously going to talk about the birth of Christ. Uh, what an important an important thing in the life of, of our history as Christians. Without, without the birth, where are we, right? Without that birth, without Jesus coming to this earth, we are lost and we are uh, dying in our sins. So we need to be thankful for that birth of that, that baby Jesus who grew up to be the Savior and Lord of all mankind, who would die on the cross for our sins. Over these next few weeks, we're going to again, we're going to dive into this story. We're actually going to be in the book of Luke for six months, for two quarters. We're going through chapter nine in this next three months. And then uh, in the spring, we'll go verse uh, chapters 10 through 24. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, this is my second attempt at the video this morning. Uh, I got about 12 minutes into the first one and it died on me. So uh, I'm praying this time that that won't happen again. Um, so there you go. That's what's going on this morning in my world. I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer and we're going to get into the history and the background a little bit of this before we get into the scripture and we're going to talk uh, about Zechariah this morning. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for the day you've given us and Lord, we, we praise you God for who you are. We pray, Lord, today that you'd speak to our hearts and draw us to yourself and help us, Lord, to, to feel your presence and to, to see how we can apply this word to our lives today. We give you thanks, we give you honor, and we give you glory, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And one of the interesting things to me uh, over these last few weeks uh, is to see how all of the lessons and all of the messages coming from Chapel Hill right now really seem to fit together. Uh, Brother Shannon on Wednesday night talked about the, uh, the, the introduction to the book of Luke. And he gave us a background of who Luke is. And if you missed that, I encourage you to find, go back and find it and watch it. Uh, because it was, really, it was really interesting and really fascinating. But it gives us a background into who Luke is. Wednesday morning, uh, I taught on John the Baptist. And we talked about uh, his disciples, his followers, how they believed that... Um, they were. It really was just a jealousy thing. They were. They were worried that Jesus had more followers and that Jesus was baptizing more people than John was. And John. John had this famous line to him. He said, "Look, I didn't come for that." He said, "He must increase and I must decrease." In other words, this is not about me. This is about Jesus. We're here for Him. We're here to bring glory to Him and point people to Him. So uh, it's, it's neat to see as we talked about this introduction to Luke on Wednesday and we talked about John the Baptist, we sort of are going to get a prequel to John the Baptist. We're going to get the backstory of his birth and his, his welcome to earth a little bit this morning. Fascinating story. And we're going to see how all these things tie together. Now, Brother Shannon told us Wednesday night that, uh, that Luke uh, was a little bit different than the other Gospels. If you talk Matthew, Mark, and John, you're talking guys who walked with Jesus. You're talking guys who walked with Paul, who, who were there close to the life of Christ. And they, they knew these, these experiences maybe firsthand. They've lived them. They've seen them. They've experienced them. Um, and Luke is a little bit different. Luke goes back after the fact and he interviews people who and, and he talks to people and he gets these eyewitness accounts from people who lived these experiences so his stories are eyewitness accounts he went and did the, did the research did the homework got the information and his letter was written to a man named Theophilus and and again brother Shannon walked us through that that connection with Luke and with Theophilus and with the other servants of, of God after the fact uh, the other night, but basically Theophilus we see was somebody who had an understanding uh, of 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 the the Jewish custom and the and the law. He understood when he said, and they went to be taxed. He knew what that meant, and he understood these things. So he's writing this letter to a man named Theophilus, so that he might understand who Jesus is, and that's why this gospel is different uh, than the others. So we jump in here, and we see this man named Zechariah. Zechariah is married to a woman named Elizabeth. The, they are they are related to the to the family of Mary and Joseph and uh, we understand that but we see that that Zechariah and Elizabeth both come from lineage that takes us all the way back to David 
These are people who have served the Lord. These are families that have served the Lord. And Zechariah is serving the Lord in this moment. He is in the temple. He is in the holy place, and he is doing the incense around. And the incense represents prayers of the people. In this time, the, uh, the only people that could go in this part of the temple were the priests, and that's the, he was one of those. But the people waited outside. It says they were praying and lifting up their prayers. But basically, Zechariah went into the holy place, and his prayer was representative of the people. So he's in there. He's doing his business. He's serving the Lord. He's being faithful. Now, this is sort of where this story becomes interesting because these two people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, believe that they were faithful to God. They believe they were doing God's work. They believe that they were, um, they were faithful servants of who God had called them to be. But in this time, they had an issue that most people attributed to a lack of faithfulness or a punishment from God or something. They were unable to have a child. So we're going to see that they're old, they're, they're past their, their childbearing years. Uh, some scripture I read said, even went so far as to say she was barren until this point, okay? And so that had a stigma, that had a connotation that they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And we see that that's not the case. We see Zechariah in faithful service. As a matter of fact, in this story, we're going to see that even after he has this vision from the Lord, when he could have just run right home and told Elizabeth or written down for Elizabeth what happened, he, he didn't. He stayed and he finished his service there. So that's sort of some of the background here. Uh, we see that, that John, John the Baptist's birth announcement is going to come even before the conception. So this news that Zechariah is going to get is not just a surprise to him, but it's pretty specific. It tells him who he's going to be, tells him what he's going to, who, he's going to be a boy, you're going to name him this, he's going to go do this. It's great and powerful stuff. So let's read the scripture together, and then we'll begin to unpack it. Starting in verse 13 of Luke chapter 1, he says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. Verse 16 says, He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children to disobedient and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. Verse 18, Zechariah speaks. He says, How can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel, For I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel who stands in your presence, in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Verse 21 says, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. And again, that term sanctuary there refers to this holy place. When he did not come out, he could not speak to them. Then they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. And she said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these, in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. One of the things that uh, I believe Zechariah is caught up in here is he's caught up in his work. He's in this, he's in this holy place, this, this passage called it the sanctuary, but he's in this place that few people are allowed to go. And he's in there offering up prayers. He's doing this incense and he's caught up in his work. And I, listen, I, you know, my mind sometimes works a little bit differently. I, I don't know if he's literally praying for a child in this moment, or if that ship has sailed and they've given up that prayer long, long ago. I, I, I don't know. We're not given those, those details. But we know that at some point in he and Elizabeth's life, they have prayed earnestly for this child. They have prayed desperately for this child, for this thing to come into their lives and this person to be born to them, to be part of their family. And that, that prayer, at least to, to, to this point, has been unanswered. So I don't know if he's in there and he's praying. I don't know if he's daydreaming and get caught up in, in the, the emotion or if he's just wishing he had somebody to pass on his lineage to. I, 
We don't know any of that. We're not given that information. But we know that he's in there and he's doing his job. And this angel appears. This angel appears and says, do not be afraid. You read eyewitness accounts of people sometimes who claim to have had these experiences or these visions or uh, God has spoken to them or these angels have come down to them or they've seen glimpses of this or that. And, and they always respond. So they say they were cool and they, they, were, they just handled it really well. And I, and I wonder about that because every time we see something like this in Scripture, the first words the angel says is, hey, chill out. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. It's just, it's just me. I'm from heaven. And, and, and I believe in this moment, it, it, A, it caught him off guard because, I mean, if an angel just appeared right now while I'm teaching, it's going to scare me a little bit. But now, I think the word scared here, this do not be afraid, is, is talking about a holy reverence, a holy fear of who the angel was. But why did he say this? He says, because your prayers have been heard. That, that means not just that God heard him saying the prayers, but there's now going to be a response. There, God has been moved to answer this prayer as part of this time. So we know that this plan that God has laid out, the, the first words here in the student book under the context is God never acts haphazardly. God didn't wake up and decide, hey, Zechariah and Elizabeth need a child today. This was a part of God's plan from the very beginning, right? Just as Jesus was part of the plan, so was John. So was, was, was this vision for, for Zechariah and Elizabeth and that John, that John would come. John had a very specific purpose to come and to point people directly to Christ. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. And that's possible that in that moment, Zechariah even went, what prayer? I've prayed a lot of prayers. Or maybe he instantly knew. I don't, I don't know. But it says, the angel says, Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Man, what a great thought. What a great moment that must have been. He, says, he goes on, and he, he, again, he, con he continues in this, this detail. He says, There will be joy and delight for you. That, that goes without saying, right? When we all find out that we're having children, when you, when you found that out in the past, if you've experienced that, then you understand the joy that comes with that. But this, this, goes, this goes even just a little bit farther. There will be joy and delight. Those words literally mean a jumping for joy, a jumping up and down for joy. So this is not just, yay, we're happy. This is, yay, this is a big deal here, okay? So we go to this next level. He says then, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Man, I tell you, I've prayed for my kids, and I, I continue to pray for my kids that God will use them mightily. I, I don't know what, what God has in store for them. They think they know, and they think they have a plan and a future figured out. But uh, I, whatever it is God calls them to do, I, I want them to be used. I want them to be used by God, and I don't want them to be great in the sight of the Lord for their glory, but for His. But I tell you, before my kids were born, if Jesus had said, if God had sent an angel to me and said, your kids are going to be great in the sight of the Lord, man, is there anything greater that can be said? We spend so much time these days trying to get our kids to be successful on the ball field, to get our kids to be successful in the classroom, to get our kids to be successful in a, in a music arena or on a stage somewhere. We should be spending more time trying to get our kids to be great in the sight of the Lord. Praying for them, encouraging them, speaking life into them. Scripture tells us that, that we're to do that, and we need to spend time with this. So verse 15 says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will never drink wine or beer. The obvious joke is that's why we know he's John the Baptist, right? Because he never had wine or beer. If he'd have had wine or beer, he'd have been John the something else. Uh, that's not true. I, that, that's, that's, that was a cheap joke. Uh, but he says he will never drink wine or beer. This really speaks more to his commitment, his, his level that he is consecrated before the Lord. He is set apart. He's willing to, to forsake everything else of the world. You know, uh, there's, there's some that think that there was a Nazarite tie in and it didn't mention hair or anything like that but it, it it's using this strong 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 drink that would just again it set us sets aside his his level of behavior it tells us he is going to be filled with the holy spirit not not later on in life but he's filled with the holy spirit from the very moment of conception from in, in his mother's womb only the power of the holy spirit the book says could suffice for the task before this prophet the Lord knew John before he was born and sovereignly filled him with the Spirit of God. What a promise. 
What a promise. What a promise. More commands, more things that John's going to do. Verse 16 says, He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That's interesting. We understand that, that Jesus has come. Isaiah told us this a few weeks ago, that, that God told Jesus, You've come, yes, for the people of Israel, but not just for the people of Israel. We don't get enough glory. God doesn't receive enough glory if just Israel turns to God. But it's for all of mankind. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes not just jews that believe but anyone who believes will not perish but have everlasting life but he starts here you will turn many of the children of israel back to the lord their god he will go before him in the spirit and power of elijah i'm going to give you this passage first kings chapter 21 verses 19 through 29 first kings 9 21 19 through 29 helps us understand that concept. You know, John is going to go and he's going to go into battle with the king. Elijah went into battle with the king, calling out sin, telling them that their sin was going to find them out. Cost both of them, especially John. John, we know, is going to be beheaded in, in, in the coming days. And, and so we see this, but when he says he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, that's what he's talking about there. And he does this to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and to turn the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous. But ultimately, this last sentence in verse 17, to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. John has his call. John has his plan. John has his gift. He has his vision. He has his, his emphasis. He has his ministry. He has his title. Your job, John, is to go and to prepare the people of Israel to prepare these people for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's coming soon. What a responsibility. What a call. What a responsibility. What a moment for Zechariah here. But now, in this moment, Zechariah is so caught off guard that when his response is one that 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 illustrates doubt. It illustrates that he doesn't he doesn't firmly believe or he doesn't understand. And I and look, we we get that. I can I can understand that. God tells us things sometimes in our first responses. What? You want me to do what? I can't do that. That's not possible. How can that But listen, we have to remember we have to comprehend that God doesn't work on our timetable. He doesn't work with our ways. You know, we we don't need to limit God. There was an example in, in here or maybe another commentary that I read that, that basically said we can block out the sun with a quarter. Think about that for a minute. If you take a quarter and you put it over your eye, you can block out the sun from coming into your eye. And what that illustrates is all it takes is just a little bit of, of, of doubt, a little bit of disobedience on our part to stop the will of God or at least to stop our part in the will of God it's not going to stop the will of God but it stops our part in it and we need to be obedient we need to not do that we need to not get in the way of what God wants to accomplish so Zechariah here verse 18 he says how can I know this really what he's saying is you got to prove this to me you got to show this to me this isn't possible we've look look angel we've prayed this for years you I don't think you're really I think you I don't think you know what you're talking about. There's no way that's that's a real thing. We've prayed this and prayed this and prayed this and prayed this to the point maybe of even giving up and now you're telling them this is real. I just don't think this is right. He says, "Don't you know who we are? I'm Zechariah. She's Elizabeth. I'm old. She's old." He knew better than to call her old, so he came up with a fancy term. He said, "She's well along in years." That was that was much nicer, right, ladies? Um, but he's saying here this isn't possible. Really what he should have said is this isn't possible with man. Because God, again, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't work that way, right? The God who created the universe is not limited by his creation. That's a great line. That's a great line right there. I highlighted that with a highlighter. That's good stuff. The God who created the universe is not limited by his creation. For I am, I am old. I, my wife is old. Angel, there's no way this is possible. You need to show me how this is even possible. How can this even work? Verse 19, I believe Gabriel's a little offended. He says, the angel answered him and said, I'm Gabriel. Listen, I stand in the presence of God. The standing in the presence of God means to have ongoing access to God, to be there not just when God at his beck and call, but he's always there. 
beside God in the presence of God and he knows the heart of God. He knows the mind of God. And God said, go, tell Zechariah what's going to happen. How do I know that? Because he says, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. I was sent. I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. He's saying, how can you not believe? You're here in the holy place. You're here doing the work of God. I'm an angel from God, sent from God to tell you this message from God. How can you not understand? Why do you doubt? Why do you not believe? So he continues on. He says, now listen, verse 20. Now listen. This is not... Here's what I got to say. This is listen and understand. There's a difference, right? There's a difference between hearing and a difference and between that and understanding. You can hear something and not understand it, right? So we want to make sure we are listening, we're understanding. You will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things, what things? Till this conception and this birth takes place. You will be silent and unable to speak until the day these things, these things take place. In other words, he's going to be punished. He's going to be punished for his disbelief, for his lack of faith, for his doubt. He's being punished. The angel says, look, you're going to get to spend the next nine months, ten months, however long it's going to be. Because, again, remember, this is before conception. This is before there is even a, a baby in, in Elizabeth's womb. Before this takes place, you're silent. Now, why did he give him silence, you think? so that he wouldn't have time to talk and, 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 and figure it out for himself and think it out with other people and communicate with other people what was going on. God wanted to make sure that he only had could listen to him. So he, he said this. He says, you're going to become silent. You're going to become mute. And he says, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. I mean, really, again, this is, this is, this is the angel saying, look, I'm an angel sent from God. Why wouldn't you believe me? Why wouldn't you believe who I am? Why wouldn't you believe what I say? So here, boom, you're silent. Now here's what's, here's what's hard about that. Because he's now got to go home and explain to Elizabeth. But how? He, he better have a pen and a scroll, right? Because that's the only way he's going to be able to explain. He's got to be able to tell her what's going on. But this is it right here. Listen to this, and I underline this again too. This is going to this is this is good stuff. God has the power to do what he says he will do. We should be careful not to doubt his word, but entrust ourselves to the perfect plan of our Heavenly Father. He loves us, he wants what is best for us in keeping with his eternal plan. Remember that. It's, it all wraps up in that, his eternal plan. As we accept his will and set aside any lack of faith, we will experience his powerful hand in our lives we have to accept it we have to have that faith to just believe what he says is, is is true what he what he says can happen can be accomplished not because we think it can but because he says it can right the end of this we see that this reality is going to be seen this thing is going to take place when 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 zechariah comes out of this this holy place when he comes out of this temple and apparently he was in there longer than he should have been verse 21 says meanwhile the people were waiting for zechariah they're out there. They've said their prayers. They've, they've offered these things up to him. They've expected him to be able to go in and say these prayers, and now they're waiting on him to come out. And he doesn't come out, 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 and then, then they're waiting. But all of a sudden he comes out, and they were amazed that he had stayed so long. And when he did come out, verse 22 says, he could not speak to them. I don't, I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't know if he normally came out and gave a report. Said something like, hey, listen, child of God, people, God has heard your prayers. I, I don't know. But in this moment, he couldn't. All he could do was come out and say, I don't know how he explains that. But I do believe they re says they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. I don't know if he had this glow. We remember back to the Old Testament when Moses went up on that mountain. Then when he came down, he had to put on a veil. Uh, maybe he had been in the presence of God, and they just saw something different about him. I, I, don't, I don't know. It just tells us they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary, and he was making signs to them and remained speechless. 
He was having to communicate to them through through whatever. I don't know if he went like this or angel or, or I, I don't know how he described it. But he had to demonstrate to them through signs. But now look at this, verse 23, where you and I would have been tempted to immediately rush home and tell whoever, right? This is me. I'm immediately rushing home to tell my wife what I've just seen, or at least the best I can portray this message to her. But he was so dedicated. He was so faithful. He had so uh, wrapped up in this moment with the angel and serving the Lord that it says when, he, when the days of his ministry were completed, he stayed. They would normally stay for this job for seven days from Sabbath to Sabbath. So he completed his task. He completed his job. He completed his service to the Lord. And then it says he went back home. I tell you again, man, I would have, I would have, I would have probably just rushed right out and said, hey, you guys got to handle this or Hey, you guys have got to handle that. I, I don't know, but he stuck around and did his job. And then he says he went home to try to explain to his wife, to try to communicate to his wife in some way. This is what's been said. Now, think back to the Old Testament with, with Abram and Sarah. And, and God makes this promise, right? And when Sarah hears, hears, overhears this, she, she laughs. She's like, there's no way. We don't, we're not given these, these moments, the immediate response of Elizabeth. But imagine her confusion when her husband comes home from the temple after working for seven days and he walks in the door and she says, hey, honey, how are you? And he goes, he begins to, to try to explain and, and me make messages and write notes and do whatever he can. But he has to explain what he heard, but he couldn't say it. He couldn't communicate it through word. Imagine her confusion. Imagine her disbelief. Imagine this moment. But now, to a certain extent, I think maybe that helped sell it. That helped convince her even more. Because once he explained, God, the, the angel said that I'm not going to be able to speak until this happens. And this is why I can't talk. But listen, this is going to take place. This is going to happen. Maybe that helped her belief. I, I, I don't know. We're not given all of these details necessarily. So some of this is just left up to us to figure out on our own. Verses 24 and 25, we wrap up here that this reality is, again, is seen. Uh, Zechariah has written this note. I, I, that's the only way I know that he can communicate with her. And, and she must have been overwhelmed with joy. She must have been overwhelmed with confusion. She must have been overwhelmed with excitement. All of the things that a mother feels, but also probably this, this, this fear, this doubt of I'm well along in my years. How, how is this going to happen? Is this safe? Is it okay? What am I going to do? How are we going to raise this child? But ultimately, ultimately, she came back to this joy. I believe Zechariah pinned out all of these words that the angel said. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. We are going to greatly rejoice. We're going to have this excitement, this jumping up and down, the angel says. And I believe in that moment, that's what happened. I believe they had this joy. They hugged. They embraced. They, they celebrated this great news that God had given them. Now it says after she conceived, after this conception, uh, that, that, that she, she, she kept herself in seclusion for five months. Just being cautious maybe. Not wanting word to, rumors to spread and things to, to, to get out. I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have all of the necessary, the, the answers on this. But um, maybe, maybe she just, that this was a way that, that, that she could acknowledge that this wasn't normal. This was, this was a, a supernatural event that was taking place. I, I don't know. But she says she, she, she kept herself in seclusion for five months. But now she gives all glory to God. Let's look at how this finishes. Verse 25, the Lord has done this. That, right. There's no other explanation. I've told you this. You've heard me say this. I've taught enough here at Chapel Hill for you. I've heard this said many times. I, I, I want so desperately on Sunday and Wednesday and in my life and in your life to see things happen that the only explanation is that God did it. And in this moment, there's only one explanation for this in their lives. God did this. She says, the Lord has done this. But now this, this she understands this is personal. Yeah, it's not about her. It's not even about John. But she sees this. You've done this for me. You've answered my prayers. How many times have you prayed for something for that long that after the fact you were just so moved, you finally did it. Thank you, Lord, for finally answering this prayer for me. We have a tendency to give up if we, within a, two days or three days or a week God hadn't answered our prayer. But 
We need to be more faithful to pray these long-term prayers. He says, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. I mentioned that earlier in the lesson. To, to not be able to conceive, to not be able to have a child in this day, it was just, just assumed you were you were living a bad life, or you were you weren't in favor with God, or you you had you weren't faithful to 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 follow what God wanted you to do. And that I mean that's not the case. We, I, that's just not how God works. Yes, God can punish. Yes, God can take things away. But everything that happens in our life that's negative is not a punishment from God. Sometimes it's to strengthen us, sometimes it's to build us, sometimes it's to draw us closer to Him. And those, those things don't sound like punishments. They may not be fun, but here we see this. But he says, she says, He has looked at with favor in these days to take away my disgrace. You see, that what God's plan was for John to come and do this, but I believe He also cared enough about Zechariah and also He cared enough about Elizabeth to, to minister to them through this, to take care of them. And look, the ultimate thing is they realized this for the blessing that it was from God. We know who John the Baptist is. We know that in these next few weeks and months that Mary is going to come to conceive in a much different way. But the, the story is still sort of the same. It's this miraculous conception, this immaculate conception, right, where, where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of, of Mary and, and, and this, this, this God-man, Jesus, is going to come. We know that they're going to be they're they're, inter, they're 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 connected from the womb, all the way through their earthly ministries. What a cool cool story! What a great story! What a way to kick off this Christmas story as we understand that uh, before Jesus comes, we have to understand that John the Baptist came to point the way to him. That's how listen. That's our job. Our job this season is not to buy gifts. It's not to talk about Santa. It's not to talk about reindeer. It's not to eat candy canes or peppermint bark, even though those things are pretty good. Our job is to point people to Jesus. Our job is to point people to Jesus, to help, to, help, to help other people understand who he is and to see who he is, to live for him, to come to know him. And what a greater time than we have than this time of year to do that. So we're going to close with our lesson there today. We're going to pick up next week with verses 26 through 38 of Luke chapter 1, if you want to read ahead there, this conception uh, that's going to take place and just, just miraculous stuff going on here in these first chapters of Luke. If you've got any questions, feel free to text, email, call the office. Somebody here will be glad to answer those for you. Uh, if you are not a person that belongs to Chapel Hill, if you're not a member of Chapel Hill and you've stumbled on this video by accident today, we'd love to have you come worship with us. We'd love to come uh, see you in our sanctuary on Sunday mornings and uh, to be a part of our family. We would welcome you with open arms here at Chapel Hill. Uh, let me pray for you, and then we will close. Father, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you speak to us. Lord, we thank you for these miracles and these signs that you've done, God, that help us help strengthen our faith in you. We love you today. We thank you. We pray that you'd help us to apply what we've heard today and live for you better. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today.